Hello, Paul. We can hear you. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I've been contemplating a lot uh, from the last two weeks ago uh, concerning violence. It's something I've been wrestling with. So I'd be interested in hearing you continue down the path of the discussion mm -hmm. of violence that Amina started uh, two weeks ago, specifically along the lines mm -hmm. of nature killing to survive. Many of us eat meat. I do, for instance, but we, we don't have to kill the animal the meat came from. I'd likely become a vegetarian if I had to kill for my own meat, so I feel like I'm a hypocrite. I support unconscionable violence toward animals, not to mention the employees that work there, as the animals are processed in mega farms for me to be able to eat meat. On the other hand, wolves introduced to Yellowstone violently control the deer population, resulting in an improved ecosystem. And if I eat vegetables, I'm killing another kind of life. Is that any better and more peaceful than killing animals? Is plant life worth less than animal life? Do they feel pain? Or are we just not able to sense their pain? And what kind of reality is it where we must participate in violent interactions to kill other life to survive in this reality? How do we recon reconcile that need with a desire to live a life of peace when we're required to kill or at least support killing to survive. And by our inclination to being peaceful, are we contradicting, contradicting the inherent violent natural order? Who made the rule that we must be violent or die and why? Is the designer of this reality, God, a sadistic sociopath, having designed a system based on violence in which most people live a life of quiet desperation? That's Pink Floyd, by the way. Does he, she, it enjoy seeing humans suffer? And don't get me started on the consequences of getting old. <laughs> that's even worse because I'm yep. uh, getting that's, into that that's now. That's kind of violent, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, all these things from, go wrong. Yeah, yes. it's like the 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 law of conservation of pain. Like if you have this pain one day, the next day that won't be there, but it'll be it'll hurt right. somewhere else. But yeah. it also got me thinking, uh, you were talking about politics, and to me, the core value of Trump is violence, but then the core value of the empire and the Democrats and Harris is also violence. I mean, that's the core value of both of them. And I yeah. like JFK Jr.'s speech uh, that I'm really uh, encouraged to hear that you helped write. And I was excited that Dennis Kucinich was on his campaign, too. Yeah. But, you know, he left, which is... Yeah really too bad but those are my questions that so okay. what i read had 12 question marks in it yeah i got it <laughs> I, I get the question um okay yeah i'm glad you mentioned old age because you know watching my father-in-law pass you know go through this process i mean he's he's suffering you know it's inevitable um and yeah, nature is rife with violence. The thing is though, most of life, especially in nature, is, is exuberant and, and joyful uh, and, um, and, and beautiful. You know, like, I can't remember how many eggs a, an octopus lays. I think it's 10, do you remember, Carrie? How many eggs? It's tens of thousands, though, right? And they hatch in these, what? Maybe 40,000, you know, uh, they hatch into these tiny little baby octopuses. <laughs> they are delectable, not only for humans, but for all kinds of fish, you know, all kinds of birds. I mean, you know, these, these of those 40,000 baby octopuses, wriggling around, living, they all, all get eaten, except um, statistically, on average, maybe two make it to reproductive adulthood and have their own baby octopuses. Another 38,998 are devoured. Uh, but even in their short lifetimes, they spend, uh, you know, half a second of that lifetime getting messily devoured by a predator and the rest of their lives could be days weeks months is 
just an exuberant expression of life. I mean, you know this, just look at minnows, you know, look at tadpoles, look at, look at, look at the birds, the butterflies flying around, there's one right there, you know, they're, they're, they're um, so appreciating and loving and, and reveling in the gift of life. It feels good to be alive. The, and doesn't always feel good to be alive. Sometimes the toothache, the backache, whatever is so bad that you that that you're like, if this is the way it's going to be from now on, I don't want to stay here. I don't want to. But 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 normally the suffering is temporary, and the baseline is bliss. So that means for me. What's important in my relations to other beings, to animals and plants, to the things I eat, it's not whether they die or not. Most of them are going to die. All of them are going to die. And in nature, most of them die um, by predation. So that's not, for me, that's not the point. The point is, how do they live? Well, what did you say, Carrie? Yeah, Carrie's asking, Carrie is my 11 year old son here. He's asking, what about the fish who live in tanks? Yeah, they're not living very well. I was about to say, for me, the important question is not whether they die, but it's how they live. And so you mentioned, you know, industrial agriculture. What bothers me about it isn't the mass death of the animal that they go to slaughter. What matters to me is that they're living in confinement. They're living in misery. And you know, what we do to the other, we do to ourselves. So we raise our food in confinement, in feedlots, in monocrop plantations, you know, where, where you just, where, where the, the plants are suffering, um, the animals are suffering. And no wonder we're raised in confinement as well. And in mono, in a monoculture uh, and, and constrained in our expression of life it's the same so for me yeah so for me it's 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 and for my own self too not just for other beings not just for the cattle how do they live not whether they will die but for me as well like my life is not about avoiding death my life is about living well and and our culture our our, our civilization programs us for the opposite it sees death as the ultimate catastrophe because that's what it is for the separate self. You know, it's the total annihilation of all, of all that is, of the ego, of the self. But, and so death is the ultimate catastrophe and our whole medical system is geared toward avoiding death, postponing death. Our whole um, uh, worldview does not value really how beautifully we live. So that's what we need to reclaim for ourselves. This is the return path that I was speaking of, to live beautifully and to let live beautifully, to make our choices based on, on what will allow the other to express the life in them, to fulfill the life in them. What is the, even, I would even refine it and say, what is the next step of my change, of my healing, of my evolution, so that the next step of theirs also becomes available to them? How do I participate in our mutual liberation? And so that recasts, you know, this whole quandary about Others must die so that I can live. Yeah. Hope that's uh, useful. <laughs>